Good morning, Crossroads Church. Is anybody ready to worship the Lord this morning? As we sing about his great things, let's lift up a great praise to our Savior. Last week, I challenged my team to go before the Lord, and when we pray, it's for a week. Don't ask God for anything. Just thank him for all the things that he's done. 
And the reason I asked them to do that is because during this time where there's so much chaos and confusion and anxiety going on, I wanted to shift our focus on the things that God is still doing. Do I have any believers who can shift to that place? So we're about to sing a new song that says, King of Kings, you're Lord of Lords, and we're singing about the goodness of Jesus. I'm looking to get back to the church where we just praise God just because of who he is, not about anything he's done. So when we sing this song, think about all the things God has done for you and tap into a worship that is so personal with your father. Crimson stain, he washed 
shed white as snow. Come on, let's fill the room. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He Because that's how it's going to be when we get back with our Savior. You may be seated in the room this morning. For the people online, we want to welcome you as well. Can we make some noise for the people that's watching online this morning? We're so glad that you tuned in with us today. But today, my name is Corbin Hogan. If we haven't met, I have a few announcements for you guys. Somebody say August the 9th. August 9th. Say it again. Say August the 9th. August 9th. 
August 9th, we are opening up our next gen environments in person here at Crossroads Studio. Yes, we will be opening up from babies all the way back to students. I'm so excited for us to have our families back in the room worshiping together. Can we make some noise? We're super excited about that. And also, I just have a lot of good news today. We are almost finished with our Carrollton building. Can we make some noise? Yes! Sorry, I'm just getting happy because God's still doing this thing in the middle of a pandemic. Can I get an amen? Hear me. But the reason why I'm really excited is not because of a building. It's because of the hope that people are going to find when they enter into the building. Because the name of Jesus, that's what we need. We need hope. If you look at our world right now, it's so much lostness, division in our world. But we need the message of the gospel. And so as we get ready to prepare to enter into our Carrollton building, we're still in need of cheers. But here's the cool part, how you get to play a part in that. If each family gave $47, you can purchase a cheer. But here's what I need you to think about. It's not about a seat, but it's actually about a soul. We have the easy part of just giving $47 for a cheer. But I want you to think about where you was when you heard the gospel. That many of your marriages was on the end. But you came in, you sat in a room, something like this, and you heard about a man named Jesus who can mend broken things, but you were sitting in the seat. So if you and your family join us in this, me and my family, we are personally given to this because I'm just thinking about that young man who is coming in, wrestling with who he is, but he will be able to come into a building and sit in the seat and the gospel will change his life forever. So join us in that. You will have an opportunity to give at the end of service. So let me go ahead and pray for our offering. And then Pastor Greg is going to come up here and preach the house down. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you. Father, we love you. Father, I pray as we prepare to give at the end of the service that you get the glory through our giving. And God, I pray even now for the people who will sit in those seats at our Carrollton campus that they will begin to find hope in you. God, I pray for Pastor Greg as he stands and communicates your word today. Let the words of his lips and the meditations of his heart be pleasing in your sight, Jesus. Get the glory. Amen. 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 All right, guys. Who's excited to be in God's house? Come on. All right. There we go. All right, so here, here's the deal is, is that we got to make enough noise for the people online uh, that are watching. They're going to think, why am I not there yet? Amen? Amen. <laughs> so I know a lot of people are on vacation. Some people are still waiting for our kids to open up, and we are ready to start back. And I get the question, well, if Douglas County School's not going back, why are we going back? Let me tell you why. Douglas County School does not have the hope of the world, but Jesus Christ is in the church, and he is the hope of the world. Guys, people need Jesus, and we are not shutting down until everybody knows Jesus Christ or until he comes back first. And so we're going to take all the precautions we can, but at the end of the day, we have to trust God, don't we? We just got to trust him. Amen? And so I just prayed and prayed and prayed, and I feel like God gave me the word that I needed. And so we're starting back. And you know what? Here's what I, I, it comes down to is you guys are adults. You have kids, but you're still adults. And we believe that you can make adult decisions. And so we just want to give you the opportunity to make a decision, though, and not try to dictate what direction we're going in. And I just really believe the Bible when it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. I think that's the word of God that needs to be said. So we're in week four. Now, I want you to know this series was a whole summer, okay? And so I just took the first four weeks of it. And so later on, you're going to get the uh, last four weeks of it. Uh, We're just going to not sandwich it together. Uh, But we're in four weeks of I believe. And why are we talking about what I believe? Because what you believe will determine where you wind up. You realize that, right? 
that what you believe will always determine the direction of your life. It'll determine the steps you take. It'll determine the friends that you hang out with. It'll determine everything about who you are. What, so it's important what you believe. And so we've been talking about this. We talked about week one about the Bible and how it's from God and so that you can know it's from God. Week two, we talked about the, that there is a God. Week three, we talked about, hey, you want to know who that God is? And he's three in one. We just sing about him and we understand that idea of the Trinity. Uh, but there's more to it. And one of the topics this morning is just to me so powerful. Uh, but it sort of starts with a question that we all have to ask ourselves. You realize, just like I realize, right, that one day on this earth you will take your last breath, right? Unless Jesus comes back first. And the way things are going, that might happen, right? But, you know, and I'm so reluctant to start a service off with that question because it's like, why do I want to think about dying? I'm just thinking about lunch right now. I mean, because I want you to grasp this. A lot of people, that's their greatest fear in this world is that you're going to die. Listen, it's going to happen. But the reason we fear it is because we misunderstand it. You see, for a Christ follower, death is just the opening of a door to what is awaiting. Amen. To somebody that doesn't know Jesus, death is a door to something else that is waiting. So the question is, is what is waiting? Now, many people believe that when you die, you just stop existing. Other people believe that when you die, you are reincarnated as something else. That one sort of gets me because if humans are at the top of the chain, then do we go down? I mean, we gave it our best shot, now we got to start over? I mean, what, what do you want to be, you know? You want a squirrel, maybe? And dodging cars the rest of your life? I don't know. What's the... It's, I'm, not, I'm not buying in on that one. I don't know about you, but it's just really hard for me to, to grab a hold of that. And, you know, there's these different ideas, though. And, and some people believe that you, you become one with the universe. But what scientists are leaning into now is, is they do believe that something remains even after your body stops breathing. Now, this is scientist. Now, not that I put a lot of stock in everything they believe, but what they have discovered is, through study, that when somebody has a near-death experience, and what that means is that they stop breathing, no brain waves, they actually died, and then they were resuscitated. What they discovered was that there was that person, even though they were physically dead, there was something that was still alive because they understood everything that was happening in the room. They could actually come back and tell you the words that were spoken by the nurses and doctors. So that's making their eyes be open. But if you read the Bible and you're a believer, you already knew that, right? You're like, you're not telling me anything. But here's the thing is, is that as a believer, since we were talking about the Bible, we established that week one, that it's from God, then I, really, I think God gives us some very clear direction of what happens to us when we take that step. You see, when we take the step... We're either stepping into heaven or we're stepping into a place of eternal punishment, which in the Bible it uses this term called hell, the place of the dead. And here's the thing about that. You have to decide what direction you're going before you take your last breath. So doesn't that make life a little more important? Doesn't that make your decisions a little more weighty that you know, hey, I'm just going to be all right. I just live it. A well, the problem is you don't know when your appointment is. You don't know when your day is. And so you can't just keep kicking it down the road and say, well, I'm young. I'm going to live it up. You know, like when you're young, you think you're invincible. When you get old, you realize, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it another day. Every time you step out of bed, you hurt, right? You'll get there. So, if there are two different choices, which do you want to choose? 
Now, we're going to save the, the hottest topic for last. And I want to spend this morning telling you why heaven is the best choice. Because I talk to some people and they're like, I, I don't want to live forever. Well, can I tell you this? Maybe it's because of the circumstances of the life you're in right now. And you think that life eternally will be what you're in right now? No, 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 no. There's more to it, all right? You need to understand the bigger picture. And I want you to see the bigger picture this morning. Because when you look in Scripture, there is a place that the Bible describes as heaven. As a matter of fact, there are actually three different components or three different levels or three different heavens, if you will. You see, the Bible tells us uh, when we look in the scriptures and we begin to talk about this idea of heaven, that there's this first heaven which is described in the Old Testament as the sky. When you go out and you see the clouds, you're seeing heaven. Why? Because it's not earth, all right? And, and as a matter of fact, we were, coming, um, we were coming down the interstate yesterday and at a distance, you could see all the rain coming. You can actually see the rain falling. You know, you've seen it before in big sheets. And I looked at it and I looked over at my wife. I said, you know what amazes me? That that much water can float. I mean, my hand gets tired carrying two gallons of milk out of the grocery store. And we're talking about thousands of gallons of water just floating in the sky. That if it all came out at one instant, it would crush you. But God's just letting it fall down a little bit at a time. And that blow you away. That God is still in control of that heaven. But then the Bible tells us in Genesis during creation that there's another level of heaven. It's the celestial realm where the stars and the moon and all of that are. That God created that. But then there's another level that you and I aren't privy to seeing. But there have been people who have seen it. Now, I know you're talking, you read things about people who died and, and they saw a bright light and all that. That is not the full story of the third level or the third heaven. And why do we call it their third heaven? Well, it's not my words. It's what the Bible teaches. You see, the Apostle Paul, uh, he tells us something about this. I want to read it to you. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. Now, I'm going to preface something real quick before we read this. We are going to look at a lot of Scripture this morning. Because it's important what you believe, but I don't want you to leave here saying, well, the pastor said, I want you to leave here saying, the Word of God said, and the Word of God said, and the Word of God said. Why? Because our beliefs will determine where we spend eternity, so you better have your belief on something bigger than just what I say. And so we're going back to the word here. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, it says, I was caught up in the what? Come on, church. Man. Woo, come on, Jesus. Help us this morning. All right. We're going to go one more time because I know you little rusty. You got to shake it off. All right. So he says, I was caught up where? Thank you, church. All right. Woo. Hopefully we got the answer when we get there, okay? Years ago, he says, I was in my body. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body. But I do know that I was called up to paradise and heard things so astonishing that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. And so here is the Apostle Paul's take on this third heaven, what he calls it. And so it's nothing you can see. It's what is awaiting for us. And he said, when I saw this, that God gave me privy to it. I couldn't tell if I was actually physically there or if I was just there in a dream because it was so real. But what I saw was so real and it was so majestic. It was so amazing that I can't even describe it to you. As a matter of fact, if I were even to attempt, God wouldn't let me probably because I can't do justice to it. So what he's saying is, all of your experience on earth, the best that you can think of doesn't compare to what he could describe. 
Amen? Amen. All right, so let's keep going. He tells us this. He says, listen. He uses this term, paradise. He's, he's trying, listen, he's trying to describe it as something that's indescribable. You know, have, have, you ever, have you ever been there where you're trying to tell somebody something and, and, and they're just looking at you with this dumb look because they can't even tell what you're talking about and you're trying your best and now you've, had, you've got charades in there and, you know, everything else because you're trying to act it out. I mean, and Paul's like, it's just, it's just it, it's beyond words. What is waiting for you? Is beyond what you could comprehend. It's like, par- what is paradise? When you think of paradise, do you have that little picture of an island out there with one tree and you're in a lounge chair? Is that paradise? You know, when I think of paradise, I think of nobody is going to call my cell phone that I don't want them to call it. Nobody going to be selling me anything. You know, I, paradise is that place where there are no gnats and mosquitoes. Paradise is that place where you eat all you want and you don't gain a pound. Yeah, come on, you're getting with me now, right? You know, listen, isn't it some of us our greatest joy is eating? I mean, I love to eat. They made, whoever made food made it good, didn't they? And the gooder it is, the worse it is for you, right? So when you begin to think of paradise, y'all quit putting that subliminal Krispy Kreme thought in my mind. Y'all know I quit. <laughs> what do you think of when you think of paradise? Do you think of that place where you and your spouse don't argue anymore? Do you think of that place where you don't have to worry about your kids anymore? What is paradise? Paul says it's indescribable. And you know, as I'm preaching this, as I was in between the services, I'm like, God, how do I do this justice? Something that is so amazing, so glorious, so outside of the mind of comprehension. How do I, how do I help people taste heaven so, they, so, that, so that the world has a bitter taste to them? How do you get to that description of it, God? It's, it's so far beyond. Because, you know, we have, have Paul here, this man, he's like, listen, I can't even describe it. It was so great. I ain't even going to try. And then you have John in the book of Revelation that God allows him to go further. Now, if you haven't read the book of Revelation, you've got to get past all the, the seals and the bowls and all the judgment. But he tells us in Revelation 4 1, he says, Then I looked and I saw a door standing open in heaven. Now, if there was ever a door standing open, it, this would be the one I would want to peek in. So he lets us in verse 1 of chapter 22, we begin to peer in to some of the things that he saw. I would encourage you go back and read up all of chapter 21, all of chapter 22 to get the big, to get the big picture. But for the sake of time, I just want to glance at some things here. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of a great street of the city. One on each side, excuse me, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are, from the, are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be written on their forehead. There will be no more night. There will, no, there will, be, there will no need for light of the lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God himself gives them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Now, now, now let's let some of this soak in from a practical standpoint. Doesn't matter when you make your tea time because it's never going to get dark. Doesn't matter what you got, it's never going to get dark. So I'm assuming if it never gets dark, maybe that means we never have to sleep, right? 
Because why would we get tired? We're in a glorified body. It's not like these old bodies here that, you know, you get so far through the day, you're like, man, I need a nap or I need something. And he says that in, in his place, he said, there's the, the tree of life. You remember the tree that got guarded in the Garden of Eden because man sins and God protected them from the tree so that they wouldn't live eternally in their sin. He said his angels, and now you get into heaven and there's a tree of life that is present there because you live forever and ever and ever. And in this life forever, why do we want to live forever? Because the same reason we want to live forever here, right? Have you ever noticed that we want to live forever? I mean, nobody wants to die, do they? Why do we keep going to doctors and we keep getting more and more medication? We keep taking more and more vitamins. Why don't we go to the gym? Why don't we do what we do? Because nobody wants to die. You don't even want any of your relatives to die. You see, the reality is that we don't really want anybody to go to heaven because you've got to take the step to get there, right? Just imagine if God answered all our prayers. You would have 20 generations living in your house. Grandma never died, great-grandma, great-great-great-great-grandma. Why? Because we don't want to die. And that is what heaven is like. Heaven is what you want. It's what you're desiring. It's just not going to happen here on earth because earth is just a preparation place for the step. Earth prepares you to walk through the door so you can experience. And all through the Bible, we see the description of heaven in this glorious form. When it's talking about there's seas that look like crystal. They're so pure. There are golden streets that you walk down. There are mansions there. Why? Because God is preparing a place. You see, God is wanting us to understand. When we get to heaven, we're not going to worry about who's got what. We're going to be amazed that we're even there. Because it's going to be so glorious. And, 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 and it keeps going, though, as we look in verse 21, or verse 4 of chapter 21. It says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the older order of things has passed away. And so here's what he means. is this economy that we live in, this world that we live in, all the things that we're subjected to here in this life, that we will get to that place where we take our last breath, that we will have pain, that there will be suffering, that there will be hardship. That's the life we live in, right? And sometimes you think, God, when is this going to be over? And he says, the day is coming. The day is coming. Now imagine... I imagine, wouldn't it be awesome if you were never in pain again? I mean, it, just raise your hand if you got some kind of chronic pain. Not that you married them, but that you got your own chronic pain, okay? All right. Wouldn't it be glad if that was gone? I mean, just you walk and you don't... Uh, you know, you're not doing this when you get out of bed and you wait until everything sort of smooths out a little bit. You know, you used to feel like you're, you're gliding again. Wouldn't it, be glad? Wouldn't it be nice that you didn't have to cry and weep over the decisions of somebody else? Wouldn't it be a blessed place if you never had to watch somebody mess their life up again? Wouldn't it be great if you never went to another funeral in your life? Just think of all the things that we go through in this life that, that are difficult for us, that many times we don't understand. Isn't it going to be great that you and I hopefully get to experience a place where it is no more? God says that's heaven. That is what he has prepared. And, and, and here's the other thing. All of that would be great, but even greater. In Revelation 21, 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. You know what? Some of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life have happened in times of worship. I can't recount to you the number of times I've stood over here during worship time with my hands raised and all of a sudden you feel the, the power of the Holy Spirit coming over you. 
And, and it's this overwhelmingness of God's glory that's sort of creeping upon you. And all of a sudden you get emotional. You begin, the tears begin to come down your, your face. And, and you know, uh, the bad part of the little snot begins to run out of your nose because you're getting like sloppy for God over there. And, you know, you got your hands raised and you're fully worshiping him. And there's never been a time where I've been in that state thinking, man, I wish this was over. I've always been in that time like, God, please don't let this in. This is the most amazing experience of all my life. I don't want to stop. I want more. I want more. I want more. God, this is what I'm alive for. And God says, that's what heaven's like, Greg. Because oftentimes... We get caught in the lures of this life. And some people say, you know what, I don't want to go to heaven. I just want to enjoy life now. Because you think that the joy that you have in this life even compares to it because you never experienced, you never tasted it, you never even touched it. And so it's so hard for us to comprehend. That's why we're talking about this. And so what we do is we, we, we can't even equate what God has in store for those who believe in him. So I want you to think for just a moment the very thing that gives you the most joy in life. Maybe for you it's a relationship. And you're in this relationship, and when you're there, you know, your heart is so warm, you're so filled, and you're like, I just can't wait to be with them again. You'll get married one day and all that will go away, okay? (laughs) No, just kidding. You can't wait. Or maybe for you it's, You're going to the beach next week, and that's all you can think about. Or maybe for you, it's, I can't wait just to sit out by the pool and have a nice, tall glass of sweet iced tea. Or maybe for you, it's, you got an X amount of dollars in your savings account, and you don't have to think about money. Or maybe it's for you, you're thinking, I've got one year, and I get to retire. And they're just things. You know what they are for you. It's that thing that you think about, that thing that you really live for, that you can't wait till it comes to fruition. And when it does, you're like, man, I am going to be at that place where I feel full. I feel full of life. I feel full of all that I've been desiring. And and what I want you to understand is when you compare that to heaven, it's going to look like rotten tomatoes because it doesn't even compare to what God has in store for you. You're going to look at it one day and say, man, and I got excited about that when this is what I had in store for me. Why in the world did I waste my time chasing this? Why in the world did I pour my life into that when I had this waiting for me? Man, it's like getting excited for a hamburger when you got a steak waking in the next room. <laughs> Guys, listen. There is more. And it's a real steak. It's not one of those vegetable steaks, okay? I know that ain't politically correct, but when you step through the doors of heaven, there's only one king and all your politics is going to stay here. Amen. And he says, listen, I love the language that he used. He says, listen, in heaven... Is, is where the leaves of the tree, the tree of life, or the, or the healing of the nations. I hope you didn't miss that. Because if anything in our world today, we need healing, don't we? Our nation needs healing. And you know what? We're, we're, all, we're all up in arms because of all the things that are going on. And we're putting our hope in a politician. We're putting our hope in an election. And I'm here to tell you, if that's where your hope is, you're going to be woefully let down when the election comes. No matter who you vote for, because they will not heal this nation. Only God can heal it. I want, I want to say something that's probably going to get me in trouble. But listen, as long as we live on this earth, there will always be racism. Let me tell you why. Because racism is a condition of the heart manifested in our actions. 
The only healing for racism is when the heart is healed. And because everybody will not trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there will always be racism because some people will never receive the message of the gospel. And they will always have a heart that is full of hate. The only hope for the world is the church that walks in the power of the Spirit because a church that walks in the power of the Spirit is experiencing a little bit of heaven on earth because the power of the Holy Spirit that was in us. And so in the church, there is no room for racism because we are to be a reflection of that day and what is to come, even in our imperfection. And so the only hope to change the world is for us to be different, us to not walk in racism, us to not walk in judgmental, us to be free from all that. So you and I are the cure for what ails the world but we will never totally cure it because they will not believe the message in totality there will always be people that don't believe so let me tell you this don't get lost up in a cause that's a lost cause live your life for a cause that will change the world and that cause is the gospel of Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can redeem us And since I'm on this topic, listen, that does not mean that we don't try to understand each other. We still need to come closer together as a church. We need to understand our black brothers and sisters. We need to understand our white brothers and sisters, our Hispanic brothers and sisters. Why? Because we need to grieve when they grieve. We need to mourn when they mourn. We need to celebrate when they celebrate. We do need to care about what goes on in people's life when there's an injustice going on. And so don't just turn your, your back and say we're all good. If somebody in the body is hurting, then we have a responsibility to come alongside of them. Amen? But never forget that Jesus is the cause for why we exist. Always. Why? Because Jesus is the door to the answer that will heal the nations. Jesus is the door. So don't get pulled into all the thing and all the hype that's going on in the political arena. Always get pulled into all the hype that's going on in Jesus' arena. Because our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the world when the whole economy and structure changes and we live in a place where there's no sorrow, there's no pain, there's no crying, there's no racism. We live together as one in Christ Jesus and he is the one that will transform us. Why? Because now the dwelling place of God is with man and where God is, there is no sin, there is no selfishness, there's none of that. The very presence and the glory of God would expel that when he stepped into it. When he steps into the room, when he steps into the place. And so when we're in heaven, all that is not more. It's gone. It's gone. You don't even cross the threshold with it. When we cross the threshold, boom, we're in glory. We will experience the very joy and peace that we've been looking for. We won't have to wonder what's next we won't have to wonder any of those things we will experience that and so why in the world would God tell us all that right now because we've got to wait for it it's like you know having vacation next year I got to wait for that and God's saying yes you got to wait for it but while you're waiting for it, it should do something to your life now when you look in the book of Hebrews there's this whole chapter chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 11, that describes all these saints of old in the Old Testament. And it talks about their faith, and it talks about their endurance, and it talks about their suffering, and it talks about their death. And when you read it, it's, it's like, you know, it encourages your faith, but it, it shows you that, that they gave it all. They even died for what they believed. And when you're reading that, you're wondering, how in the world could you die for something? And how in the world could you give up your life for this cause uh, of the Christian faith? How could, you li- how could you give it up? And listen to what it says about them. In verse 16 of chapter 11, it says, They were longing for a better country, 
a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so here's what he was saying. At the end of all this, he's saying, listen, the way they endured is because they had their eyes not on this world, but on the next world. They had their hope not in this world, but in the heavenly realm. And so here's what God is telling us. If we want to outlast this world and all that's thrown at us, then stop looking at this world. Let's let the guy that went there to the third heaven tell us what his thing was. What's his conclusion? Colossians 3, 2 through 4. 2 through 4, Paul speaking. Set your minds on things that are what? Come on, church. Things where? That would be above. So if I set my mind on them, what am I thinking about? If I set my mind on them, what do I contemplate when nobody else is around? If I set my mind on them, what am I living for? If I set my mind on them, what is my conversation about? If I set my mind on it, it permeates every faculty of my body and my life and my mind. And so God's saying, listen, church, if you want to live right in this world, then stop focusing on what this world has for you. Set your mind, and for many of us, we need to reset our mind, right, on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in where? Where do you think glory is? Heaven. It's where the majesty of God, it's where the presence of God, it's where the greatness of God, it's where everything that we really desire in our soul, because our soul was created to connect with our creator, is what we really want in life, whether you realize it or not. And all this other stuff is just smoke and mirrors. It's trying to drag us in a direction that will never satisfy our deepest longing. But here's the reality of it. The reason we keep doing what we're doing is because of the hope of heaven. You know why I get up here every week? Listen, I could make more money doing something else. I could do something else where I don't have to listen to people complain. I could do something else where I don't have to depend on other people. I, just, I could do something else that was much freer, but you know what? That's not what God called me to do. And I realize when I step into heaven, because I have endured whatever God has put in front of me, then one day there'll be a full reward for what I have endured and what you have endured. So when people ridicule our message, we don't take it personally, we take it to the king. When people reject us, we don't take it personally, we take it to the king. When people drag us down or try to drag us down or or, or talk bad about us, we don't let it soak into our life and change us. When people try to throw things at us, when sin comes and knocking at our door, we just keep the door closed because you're not invited into this house. Why do we do that? I have something better. God has something better in store for me. Why in the world would I trade my Cadillac for a Volkswagen? Why in the world would I trade my Ferrari for a scooter? Why in the world would I trade my riches for rags? Why in the world would I give up all that God had for me for what this little world tries to lure me with? Why? Why? Set your mind. Reset. So here's the thing. If it's that great, don't you think it would be imperative that I know for certain that I'll go there one day? I mean, you know, I talked to a lot of people. I said, you want to, hey, you know, if you took your last breath today, where, where do you think you'd go? I hope I'll go to heaven. Or in today's culture, I, I don't know. How do you know you're going to heaven? 
I mean, to me, that would be a great question to be able to answer because, I mean, if you got to decide in this life and you don't know when this life will end because you didn't get an expiration date, did you? When you were born, they didn't send you home with an expiration date? I was looking at my eggs the other day. I like, you got three days to eat these things. You don't have one of those, do you? Why? Because you don't know. I don't know. But if you knew, probably scares to death, so God didn't tell us, number one. But if you knew, you know when you had to be ready. So you could wait to the last hour and say, Jesus, get me ready. But since you don't know, and you, you, I would assume you want to go to heaven, because after I talk about the other topic later, you're going to certainly want to go, I promise you. So how do I know? Well, you know, when I look in the Bible, it says that in order to go, that I've got to be a citizen. So you've got to have your citizenship in order to go to heaven. Just like, you know, you come to the United States or you go to another country. Uh, it's easy to get in when you're a citizen. Why? Because they're welcoming you back. And God's saying, in order to be welcomed into heaven, you've got to be a citizen. You say, well, how do I get my citizenship? Well, let me tell you what it says about being a citizen first. It says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we eagerly wait for him to return as our Savior. And so there's got to be that part. But in order to be a citizen, you've got to be recorded as a citizen. And so listen to what it tells us in Revelation 21, 27. It says, nothing impure will enter it, speaking of heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. So how you live does determine something because uh, when you're a citizen, you live differently, and I'll tell you why later. He says, but only those whose names are written in the what? Lamb's book of life. And that's not the little lambs, okay? I know that's a different thing. It's the Lamb's book of life. So who in the world is the lamb? Because we're not in a barnyard anymore, right? And so when we look in the, the Gospels and we see John the Baptist out doing ministry, he looks up one day and he points to a person and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So there's some connection with that lamb in this book. Why? Because they both bear his name so the lamb's book of life let's go to another passage in john 14 he says jesus john 14 6 that i am the way the truth and the what no one comes to the father except through me and so now you see that not only you have the lamb part of it but the lamb book of life the life part is connected to that same person because he is life and if we have him then we have life because he is not just the way to life he is life itself so let me get this straight the lamb's book of life is the book that Jesus controls. He controls who's in it. It's his book. It's his record. And so how do I make sure my name is in it? Have you ever been to school? Some of you look like you have. You, you have been to school. Have you ever been there when they're calling roll though? They still call they don't call roll anymore, do they? They do. Okay, good. I think. But you remember the first day of school when you go and you sit down and they start calling roll? How did you feel when your name wasn't on the roll? <laughs> Scared? Yeah, like, who am I, right? I mean, I know that this is, I think this is, I, I hope this is where I'm supposed to be. And you, you start, do you, do you, do you, now I sort of started feeling a little inferiority thing. You know, it's like you, you feel out of place and you, you feel sort of embarrassed. And, you know, then they do the thing that's going to embarrass you the most. If you didn't get your name called, come up to the front of the room. And you're like already an introvert and your worst nightmare had just happened on the first day of school, right? And so you're like sweating, you know, and you're hoping that other people get up and you're the only one. Just send me back down to sixth grade, okay? (laughs) 
wouldn't it be even that much more ashamed if you thought your name was in the book and one day you die and realize it's not it would be more than embarrassment it would be utter hopelessness where there is no hope where you don't have another chance where you can't go back that would be the worst possible thing that I could even think of in my mind that you wouldn't have your name in the book because you didn't know the person of the book so how do I know Acts 4.12 please listen salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name what name the name of the Lamb, Jesus, under heaven, given to men, by which we must be saved. It doesn't matter what your grandparents did. It doesn't matter what your parents did. It doesn't matter what they believe. It is not going to vicariously transfer over to you. It will not affect your eternal destination one iota in the moment because you have to make your own decision it does not matter how good you are it doesn't matter if you cut your neighbor's grass as a sign of helping somebody that's a widow or an elderly and you cut it for two years it doesn't matter if you did all that when you get up there that is not what gets your name in the book it doesn't matter how many times you came to church it doesn't matter how many times you were baptized it doesn't matter how many times you raised your hand it doesn't matter how many times you walk down the aisle it doesn't matter any of those things do not matter if your name never got in the book now you could have done some of those things because your name and because God was calling you but if you are relying on those things by themselves then you may just be mistaken that you might die one day and you might get to that place where you found out that you did something but your heart wasn't connected to it and now the truth is right in front of you that you never really knew Jesus as your Savior. I could not think of anything worse. I could not think of anything worse because it's irreversible. It's irreversible. You see, right now, where you sit, there's opportunity because you're still here. Where you're listening, there's opportunity because if you made that choice, if you thought you made that choice, but nothing really happened in the book, you see, God sees your heart. He doesn't just see your lips. He doesn't just see your hands. He doesn't just see the water. God sees your heart. And if your heart is not connected with the decision, then your name doesn't go in the book. How do I know if my heart is connected, Greg? Romans 10, 19. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now leave the verse up there. You confess with your mouth. In other words, something comes out of your mouth. There's something that's out of your mouth that's connected to your brain and connected to your... Jesus, I confess that you are Lord. I confess that I am no longer Lord, okay? You see, that's the real problem. That's what sin does. It makes us think that we're Lord of our life, that we call the shot. And now I'm making a transition because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in my life. I am confessing that you are Lord now, Jesus, in my life. To confess it, you can't be ashamed of it. See, sometimes we ask people to raise their hand, and they're afraid to raise their hand to make a decision. Listen, if you're really confessing, you don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what everybody thinks about you. Amen. Amen? But here's the part. It's so easy for our mouths to move, isn't it? I mean, how many times have you told your spouse you're going to you do something? With your mouth, right? And then you just, man, I got that over with. 
It's not that way. You see, sometimes with God, we just we just we give him lip service. We get we do we say it with our mouth, but he gets the next part. He says, and believe in your heart. There has to be a heart connection to this decision, a heart transformation. Why? God's gonna change your heart. And when he changes your heart, he changes your life. When he changes, listen to me, when he changes your heart, he changes your life. Your lips don't change your life, your heart change changes your life. And God is the only one that can change your heart. He says, we believe in our heart, what? That Jesus or God raised him from the dead. He said, you will be saved. What am I doing? I am saying, God, listen, I realize who I am and I need you to be my savior to save me from my sin because my life is ridiculed with it. And I am confessing right now, Jesus, that you are Lord of my life. No longer is this stuff in control of me. And God, I believe that I can't save myself no matter how good I am no matter how many times I come to church no matter how many times I've been baptized God I believe that there is no work that I can do that will save me except believing in what you did it's not your effort it's his work but I have to believe it how do you know that you believed it your life it's changed. Listen, look at the last word. Put it back up there. Last word is what? Saved from what? Saved means I am delivered. It means I am rescued out of. Out of what? That life, that sin, that, that, that way of living. I'm rescued out of. Why in the world would Jesus say, I want to save you and then leave you there? He doesn't. But if it's just my mouth, I'll be exactly where I've always been. But if my heart is connected to it, I will be a changed person. I promise you. How do I know? I tried it the first way. Eight years old, I tried it. If you know me as a teenager, you look at me and say, there's no way he knows Jesus. Verse 22 years old, I finally had a meeting with Jesus. He said, there's no way you know me. Because your life has not changed. When I change a heart, I change a life. And I said, Jesus, I need to change heart because I definitely need to change life. That's all I'm saying. Do you want to be sure? Do you want to be sure? Can I help you be sure this morning? Would you just close your eyes for a moment? If you're online, close your eyes right where you are. Don't let the kids distract you. If you're online, just focus in. If you're in the building, if you have any doubt in your mind right now this morning that God ever changed your heart, and this morning you want to be 100% sure that you have a changed heart so that one day you will walk through the door of eternity in heaven with Jesus to experience all that he has for you. And this morning... You don't need to gamble. You don't need to take a chance. If there's something that has doubt in your mind, then there's probably doubt in your heart. And that doubt in your heart could just very well be the Holy Spirit trying to reveal to you this morning that there's something missing. And so if you feel like there's something missing, that maybe you're not 100% and you want to be 100% this morning, you want to know beyond a shadow, and you don't care what other people think, then right now, where you sit, where you're watching online, I want you to do something as a sign of confession. I want you to lift both your hands up to heaven and confess with me this morning the confession that will change your life for all of eternity. And you don't care what anybody, you just lift them up right now. Everybody else has got their heads bowed, their eyes closed, and your hands are toward heaven and you're saying God I surrender to you this morning right where you are with your hands up this is your prayer to him Jesus this morning I confess that I am a sinner and I can't save myself I believe that you died on the cross you rose from the grave to save me from my sin
Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my personal Savior, to change my heart, to change my destiny, to write my name in your book this morning beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's my confession, God. Thank you for saving me exactly the way you said you would. And God, for those in the room this morning that already know you, God, for us that have gotten our minds off of heaven, God, we have quit peering into heaven, God, and we've lived like this world is all there is. God, we ask you to forgive us this morning. We ask you to restore us this morning. We ask you, God, to reunite us, God, with the proper way to live, the proper thing to live for, God, that you renew our minds this morning, God. You renew our hearts this morning, God, so that we are living for you, God, not for a worldly cause, but for a heavenly cause, God, so that we will endure the hardships of this life for the sake of the gospel of Jesus, God. That is our hope this morning. That's our desire this morning and God if we're living anything else Lord we confess it is sin and we leave it behind us this morning and God as we stand to our feet this morning and sing this song about our God who's glorious and resurrected and powerful God we want you to be highly exalted in this place and we want you to be that same in our lives when we walk out of this building God that this world would know that there is still hope because Jesus is hope it's in Christ's name we pray Amen By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected King is resurrected me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrected me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrected me in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrected me by your spirit i will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrected
over yourself. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. We speak to dry bones. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. We speak to death. Sunday with us, but we do know as well as in this room and online that many people chose to take a next step, whether that's to start a relationship with Jesus, and we want to hear from you. So if you're in the room, we'd love to meet you at our guest services center online. Please click the link so we can be in the know about the next steps that you are taking. But Crossroads family, I love you guys, and we'll see you guys back here next Sunday. We let you hide, Yahweh.